Hello, everybody. Today on the show, I have Brendan Dell, who is going to be talking to us about positioning, including what the heck that actually means, because we hear a lot about it. Uh, or as he likes to call it, becoming unignorable, which I love as a statement. Uh, anyway, before we dig in, welcome to the show, Brendan. I'm so excited to have you here. Hey, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So you have a framework and a lot of experience in this, but before we get into the nitty gritty there, I'm curious, what would you say that your personal superpower is? My personal superpower? It can be wow. business related, but you, not your company. Sure. Um, I, you know, honestly, I think if I have a superpower at all, it's listening to people. I think I'm very interested in what people have to say. I'm very interested in you know, the problems that they're dealing with and the situations that they're in. And I think a huge, you know, part of what I do is listening to people and, and reflecting that back. So that is 150% a super, that is like the most important superpower. Okay. Maybe I'm biased, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think it's really important. I'm curious in your words though, why does the world need what you do? Why does the world need people who listen and can reflect that back? I think most people actually know the answers to their questions in general. And when mm -hmm. I work with folks, you know, a lot of times they know the answers. It's just, um, it's tough to make the decision. All, like all good mm -hmm. strategies, all good uh, points of focus all by, by definition require trade-off, right? Um, and so that is often difficult to choose an alternative over another. And the default often is, to try to do everything. I'm as guilty of this as, as everyone. And yeah, to to be, called out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and to try to be everything to everyone and mm -hmm. listening to people, understanding their concerns, their, you know, um, trepidation around the trade-offs they have to make and helping them work through those uh, eventualities, uh, you know, seems to be helpful. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm hearing is that it's not just that you you know, provide a space for people to speak. It's that through the process of doing so, and in, I'm, if I'm hearing correctly, in somewhat of an active way, you're helping them sort through kind of the chaos that's going in on in going on in their brains and help them kind of understand what it is that they maybe knew all along, like where it is to focus or what decision to make or kind of what action to move forward with. Am I in the right ballpark? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so leadership, of any level, and especially if you own your own business, it's lonely, right? Like you've got a lot yeah. of folks that rely on you and you know you, you can have conversations with those folks. And if you've got folks in, in you know, strong leaders, you can use them as a sounding board, but ultimately, you know, you, you have to make those decisions, especially in a, you know, small and mid-sized company. Mm -hmm. um, so having somebody who's been there, who can have the external perspective that can help you reflect without feeling like you need you know, any, any guard up around what the implications might be for that person or their working environment or so forth. Uh, again, I, you know, I, I just think it helps to, people to create a lens for themselves around how to, how to think about things. Yeah, yeah. Well, of all the people I have asked this question, your answer is like so, so, so close to my heart. Uh, because I think, you know, when people ask me this question, I talk about like, you know, like communication, but really I love how, your owning, how listening, which people often consider to be kind of a passive process, could be not just an active process, but an extremely valuable one. Uh, and one that you, you don't just kind of sit back and do. It sounds like there, there's more to it rather than just being present. So I'm, we might come back to that. Sure. But I do want to dig into this topic of positioning a little bit. Now, I have my sure. own ideas about what this means, but it's come to my attention as I talk to other people that lots of people have kind of a different understanding of what even the term positioning means. So I'm curious, in your own words, can you kind of define what that means for us? Yeah, it's it's differentiation is what it is. It's it's mm. owning space in, in a customer's mind so that when they have mm. a specific goal need um, that you're the one who pops into their mind, right? Like, you know, Crest fights cavities, right? That's that's an exercise in positioning that if you're concerned yeah. about cavities, <laughs> Crest is gonna solve that problem. Um, and you can look at a lot of different categories and, um, you know, see examples like that, but at its essence, positioning is differentiation. 
differentiation. That makes sense. Uh, I like what you said about how it is owning space in someone's mind. Uh, and I recently had this experience where uh, I had just moved into a new place and the floor, I had a different floor and I needed to get something to clean the floor. And I swear to you, it has been at least 15 years since I've seen like a Swiffer Sweeper commercial. But I went into the store and I like to consider myself someone who kind of does the research and doesn't just kind of go off of commercials. And holy cow, did I realize that 15 years later, they still own a space in my mind because I went out and bought one. And let me tell you, I would not recommend it. It was problematic in many different ways. And I realized I needed something else. But even, you know, as a marketer, that that has a lot of power. Now, I do think in today's age, we have perhaps more effective and ethical ways uh, than the days of yore to create strong positioning. And uh, yeah, let's get into that a little bit. So if we're talking about agency leaders, you know, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see all the time in how people approach their own positioning? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the most common one in the agency world is, is lack of positioning overall, right? Like if, if you're mm, just- um, Too real. Yeah. It, 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 <laughs> The, the agency business is a service business. So it's easy to just become a catch-all. And like to, to use a different example, it's just, you know, say you're a cleaning company, we, we clean all sorts of stuff, right? Like we, anything you want, you want cleaner, we'll clean. It's a very different thing to say, for example, like we specialize in cleaning um, great, you know, class A office buildings or whatever. So, you know, choosing a space and being willing to double down on on that space and owning it, I think is the biggest thing that, that agencies do not do. They understandably, because where they start usually early on is with some relationships with some mm -hmm. folks and they are fulfilling services and, and staffing around that need. But if you want to scale and you want to develop resonance, there's got to be some deliberate attempt to, like we said, own some space in people's minds and help them understand that, you know, you, you are a, a specific kind of company for a specific kind of person. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. We help a lot of people to go through that exact process. Yeah. Um, now, would you say it's more important to kind of uh, pick, because we're talking about kind of like niching here, right? Like, would you say it's important to kind of pick a space or an angle, like any kind of niche or positioning rather than not have any? Or is there kind of like a, a process in terms of how to determine that, that you would recommend to make sure it's effective the first time? Or Quick, sure. quicker, maybe not the first time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. So first of all, I'll say that positioning is an ongoing process, right? Markets change mm -hmm. and dynamics change. So one thing I always encourage companies to do is not to see any, you know, hypothesis they create around how to differentiate themselves as a, as a sword they have to, to die on that it's, mm. you know, they have to live with this. Now, if you really want, you know, to own a space like, it, we'll use Drift. Are you familiar with Drift, the technology company? It's a marketing technology company. Hmm, I so don't think so. Let's just say category creation, right? If you want to try, try to create a new category, it's going to take investment over a period of time, right? It's not going to happen mm -hmm. right away. But I would encourage folks to not think about any of this as, as an irreversible decision, to use Jeff Bezos's language, right? This is a door mm -hmm. you can open, see if it resonates, and then if it doesn't, you can move, you know, move on to something different different. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is that done is the new perfect. Uh, make, yeah. make a decision. You don't have to be stuck with it forever. Yeah. Um, but uh, what I'm hearing is maybe that if you don't, you might be paralyzed and not be able to get those advantages for a long time. Yeah. And I think to answer your original question, which is, do they yeah. need to niche in a specific area? Yeah. Um, I don't think niching has to happen necessarily in the way that people think, which is, let's just say, you need, you know, we are advertising for technology or we are, we only do, you know, I don't know, CPG. Um, mm -hmm. You can focus in those ways, but I think other ways that you can focus now is on outcomes, right? You can, you know, intellectual property content marketing is nothing new, right? But you can own IP, you can own outcomes that you help people achieve. You can position based on, um, capabilities, right? Like creative could be, the problem is most agencies can't actually fulfill on this. But if you use like <laughs> something like 72 and Sunny, um, they own creative, right? It, for big for big consumer brands, they own, they own the space of creativity in people's minds. So it really is about, if people can have one, if people are gonna think about one word, 
right? When they think mm -hmm. about you, what's that mm -hmm. one word they're going to remember? Because that's realistically about all the space you're going to get from people. Um, they're not thinking all that much about their ad agency or their toothpaste or whatever. <laughs> that's so interesting you bring that up. And, and I have to ask myself, I'm immediately I'm asking myself, I'm like, when people think of a Nancy, what are the words they think of? And, and I can, a word does kind of come to mind, which is processes or copy processes. So right. that's interesting. I, I challenge other people to do that exercise and see if it comes quickly for them. Um, now I'm curious, one, one way that I've heard uh, this process framed that really yeah. resonated for me, and I'm curious what you think of it, is to find your particular mountain and climb to the top of it and defend it. And it almost doesn't quite, like your mountain could be a vertical, it could be an outcome, it could be a specific service that you do in a unique way. But the important thing is, rather than kind of trying to take on space that's already owned, so to speak, figuring out what differentiates you from all of those people, not going after someone else's positioning and making that your thing, essentially. What, what I'm curious what you think of that suggestion. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it's really important. And I, I think that said, so when I consult around this, one of the most difficult things to get, to get around with folks is, is the question of, so I'm, do, I'm, I'm working with a company right now that does, um, without getting into the weeds of it, they, they, they sell and aggregate data. And yep, yep. They, the question becomes, well, is this truly something that no one else does, right? And this mm. becomes a question for the leadership team. And the answer is, it's almost never the case that mm. you're doing something, that there is a capability there that no one else in the world does. Mm -hmm. Almost never. So it's more important to just find a way to be memorable. This is why I go to the unignorable thing because it's yeah. di being different and pattern interrupts is usually enough to get you considered, right? And that's what the positioning mm -hmm. is about is to be considered for this thing and to be, to be sought after for this thing. And so um, I think it's a trap to think you're gonna be in a place where you literally do something that no one else does or make a promise that no one else does. Um, it, it's almost never the case. Okay. Okay. So what I'm hearing is that in reality, that maybe sounds nice, but it can be easy perhaps to fall into the trap of thinking that no one else must have ever done what you do before. You have to be hundred percent unique. And what I'm hearing is that becoming unignorable or differentiating yourself is really about figuring out what it is that you do, that people can remember that's simple, that stands out. Yeah. And that quality is what's unique, not necessarily your product or your service or, you know, like, well, your brand as a whole, hopefully is unique. <laughs> but uh, I, I think the question he, here is what makes that brand unique? And I'm hearing it's, it's how you do it, not necessarily what you do. Is that yeah, it, it's, it absolutely is. And, you know, what you're really doing with positioning is, is you're trying to get somebody to change their behavior, right? So they're mm -hmm. doing something right now, whether it's using someone else or um, solving the problem another way, or the problem isn't a big enough problem for them to really care about right now. And so you're trying to make a statement that is going to get them to change their behavior from what they are doing now to what they're going to do later. So mm -hmm. finding ways to be remarkable in a way that, uh, you know, that they will that 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 pushes on that change and that stands out in their mind is really you know that is the game okay okay and what is the role of vulnerability in this maybe this is uh, an abstract question but I guess when I think about, you know, being memorable or being unique, my brain goes in two directions. One is kind of doing crazy things that get attention that are maybe like really big or creative. And yeah. the other is in kind of, kind of the opposite, it's kind of like going internal and being like, what is it that we have or that we do that we can kind of share with the world that is maybe a little bit scary. So I, I'm curious whether you have to kind of be vulnerable a little bit or whether you can kind of go in the direction of like uh, maybe bigger things that catch attention and are memorable uh, for their own sake, perhaps. I think that you have to do what is authentic to you, you know, and I think that that's an important characteristic, especially for small, mid-sized businesses that are mm -hmm. so founder led, right? That are so personality and relationship led. People mm -hmm. are coming to these kinds of companies because there is some 
secret sauce in the in the people and in the relationships right so bringing that personality out bringing those views out um i think whether that is big and flashy or whether that you know to use the, the word you're using vulnerable i think it needs to be authentic to the organization and the the individuals okay i i love that <laughs> which is what i'm hearing is that the critical thing is not how kind of like big or small or personal that you go it's that you're not making it up and faking it. it it authentically reflects who you are as an organization or perhaps who you are as a founder leading that organization and uh if i'm not mistaken uh i i'm kind of hearing that this is important because otherwise you're making a promise that you can't fulfill you know you might be getting people's attention but once they come back to you well maybe what they're experiencing isn't actually <laughs> going to be aligned with who you are so therefore you lose that momentum is that Correct it's me that, if I'm totally off. No, base, yeah. no, I, I think you're thinking about it right. And I, the, you know, the other part to me is no one is going to, first of all, people aren't going to remember a lot about you, right? They're going to remember a mm. few things. And in order to get them to remember anything at all, you're going to have to say it a lot, right? You're going to mm. have to be out there again and again in front of people in different ways, preaching your message. And if it's not authentic to you and something that you care about, you're just not going to have the steam to, to keep it up, right? When at the beginning, yeah. for everyone, people aren't going to pay attention, right? Mm. <laughs> um, so I think that's why authenticity is really important. And on the other side of that, uh, not to get a, you know, woo-woo about the whole thing, but there is only one of you, right? Or one of, of the, mm. the person. And that that is a point of uniqueness, especially in relationship-driven businesses that some people won't like you. To take Gary Vaynerchuk is a very famous right example right some mm -hmm. people do not like his personality some people do but everyone has an opinion and so mm. it's far better that they have that opinion than no one care at all and most agencies are in this space where no one cares at all and so that's you know that's the dangerous trap that makes a lot of sense to me and it leads me right into another question which is what is the difference between, you know, marketing or positioning yourself based on, uh, you know, what you do and what you offer, or maybe how you do it versus marketing or positioning yourself based on who you are, uh, like at the root as a person or an organization? So I think about all this is a story that you're creating, that you're promising change um, mm -hmm. for the people that you're helping to serve, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, so yeah. At the foundation, I think about this with technology and it's even more relevant uh, with agencies where mm -hmm. to think that you're really the only agency that can write or design or help with positioning or any of these things, right? It's, it's an unrealistic idea and, and you may be very good at it, but so are others. So people will replicate your products and services, but if you, if you put forward an authentic position and authentic story, they can't replicate that. Right, it's very mm. difficult to replicate that, um, and that becomes your differentiator. It's the same reason that people buy Tylenol instead of acetaminophen, and so forth, because they're telling a story around quality and telling a story around these things that people believe, and so it becomes true. One example I like to use a lot is um, there's a glass there's a glass company uh, that sells wine glasses called Rydell mm -hmm. uh, that I you know people. If you're into wine, people know about this. And they mm -hmm. did a blind taste test with wine drinkers. They said, drink out of a Rydell glass, drink out of a regular glass, right? Can't, you know, what do you think is better? So they did this blind and they did it while they were using, they, they could see the glasses. Well, mm -hmm. the wine aficionados could, you know, believe that their wine tasted better. They could smell the aromas and so forth better using the Rydell glass when they could see it. When they did this blind, nobody could tell they were totally inaccurate in their believe you know in their ability to identify it mm -hmm. the story of the glass right they believed that this yeah. thing was improving their their experience and so it did and the same is true with agencies if people believe in the personality and, and the position you put out they're going to choose you instead of the you know the variety of other alternatives out there for them hmm yeah that that makes a lot of sense i think a lot of people do you think that people feel concerned, like this actually came up in an uh, interview that I just did. Uh, do you think that people feel concerned, like hesitant to commit to their positioning because yeah. they're afraid? Uh, yeah, yeah. Why? Why? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Why do you think people are afraid? 
I think they're afraid of alienating people. And I think they're afraid, you know, they think that they want to be everything to everyone. And it comes back mm. to, you know, if you try to be everything to everyone, you're, you're, you know, Nobody you appeal to no one. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I think that we all have that concern true about just putting ourselves out there generally mm -hmm. um, and about people's judgment around, you know, that what, what will be, but I, I think you would, the most well-known loved people, right? They do come out with their authentic selves, right? Sarah mm -hmm. Blakely uh, from Spanx is, you know, constantly talking about um, her journey to success and so forth. She's very authentic in the way she communicates and it's a huge driver for the brand, right? And I think, you know, so I, I think that it's just people's fear of being judged that mm -hmm. keeps them from moving forward and you just, and fear of alienating potential customers. But what you find once you start doing this properly is that you, for the every one person you turn off, 10 more uh, come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just wanna kind of flash back to what you said earlier, which is that it's more important for people to have an opinion one way or another than to not really care at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. So. I'm curious here, uh, we work with, you know, we, we work with some people who struggle with their kind of positioning and niching, but we also work with a lot of people who have kind of chosen their, their space, their offer, the how they do it, their differentiation, the way to become unignorable, so to speak. Yep. But picking a niche on its own hasn't necessarily had that effect because maybe there's other people in the niche, maybe they haven't gone any further. So. For people who have kind of picked their direction or their audience or their focus, but are still struggling to become unignorable, do you have an idea over what that gap can look like? Maybe there's not one big thing you see the most, but maybe a few, like two or three things that you see that uh, are blocking people. People are opportunities. External. Yeah, people aren't external enough. They may they'll 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 have this discussion internally and they'll change the headline on their website and then, uh, but they do you need to bang that drum you know and so mm. you've got to you've got to bang it in videos in articles in in talks in uh you know it, everywhere that you can think of and you need to bang it for a long <laughs> period of time and how long sorry sorry to interrupt you but how long no no but you know how long as when you start to be so sick of saying the same thing <laughs> that you can't stand saying it another time you're just about set it You're off. almost there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that, that's a relief because uh, I feel like we could write a book of say, I mean, we have written some internal documents with it, but not quite the same of like say isms, like say stuff I have said so much that people can almost say it along with me. So I'm almost there. <laughs> you're, al you're almost there. I mean, if you go, 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 you know, look at a celebrity launching a movie or a book, right? And what you'll see is, they will tell the same story on every podcast. They will tell the same narrative about the movie. They'll relate the same stories from the book. They may do it in slightly different ways, but they will do that hundreds, if not thousands of times over a period of time in order to launch those assets, your IP, your brand, whatever it is. It's the same way. It needs to be overwhelming force. It can't mm. be a headline change and then Nothing happens. Wait for people to show up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our, our process actually is broken down into three discrete steps for this exact reason, because we used to focus on basically writing a positioning document, which we call our copy reference guide. Uh, and then, you know, building the foundation copy, the website or the landing page or the thing. And then people would be like, well, where are all my clients? And it's like, well, you built it. How yeah. are people finding you? How are, you know, <laughs> how are they understanding that you now serve them or that you have always served them and that you do what you do well? So I'm hearing that the missing step, just like our third step, which, uh, you know, we've been a business for five years, but just in, in the last year that we've really focused in on this is uh, it, it's similar. It's like, go out, find your audience, get in front of them, share your message, produce the content, do the thing. Don't just build it and expect them to come. Is that yeah that that's exactly right and you know i'm curious what do you think why, why do you think you know that that people don't get known um for for their position or why do you think it it, it fails well 
I mean, there's what I think, what I, what I hear all the time is very similar to what you said, which is that people are afraid of excluding, uh, right. you know, they're like, well, if we, uh, this way, we're just going to pigeonhole ourselves and no one else is going to be able to find us or take advantage of our services. And what I tend to say to those people is these are the, uh, actually reflects uh, your messaging as well. Is like, these are the people that you cannot ignore <laughs> and that you do right. not want to ignore you. That doesn't mean that they're the only people, just the ones that you don't want to be focused over there. There when you have this group of people that you have chosen to focus on, that you have messaging aligned with, that you can really help with a problem. Um, yeah, anyway, so that's kind of the official answer. But if I were to say what I personally think it is, I think it goes deeper than that. And I think it is a vulnerability. I think that mm -hmm. people are afraid to be vulnerable. They're afraid to stand out. If I had a dollar for every time we had a client who at the beginning of the process was like, I want to stand out and differentiate myself. And then when we actually go through that process, they're like, well, no one else sounds like this. <laughs> and we're like, well, well, yeah, that's that's the point. And they're like, well, yeah. now I feel like people aren't going to like me because I don't use the same generic phrases that everyone else does. And, and I think it goes deeper than just fear of alienating people. I think it's fear of uh, being vulnerable and putting a part of themselves that is unique and different for the world to see and potentially, you know, hate, yeah. <laughs> I guess. No, I, I, I think that's, that's astute, you know, and it, I think when people are fear, you know, afraid of alienating people and so forth, first of all, it's who do you personally relate to? Like mm -hmm. you can look at the kind of people you relate to, whether it's online or in other venues and it's people who are, who, who are themselves generally, right? It's not the people mm -hmm. who are like vanilla and have nothing to say and no opinion and so forth. Yeah. And the other thing is when people are concerned about turning away business or alienating business, if you're in a relationship driven business, like an agency, no one's telling you that if your good client X refers in potential opportunity Y, but it doesn't necessarily fit with your positioning to turn away that business. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is create a clear brand to go to market with so that on your yes. outbound, what you're doing externally, people start to develop recognition, but it doesn't mean yes. you can't be opportunistic, you know? Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, we just, I just had uh, somebody uh, call my cell phone recently looking to work with us. And it was essentially a referral where they had, uh, you know, seen the work we'd done with someone else. But when I asked, you know, oh, where did you hear of us? His response was, well, I've seen your name around for years. Uh, mm -hmm. And actually, despite the fact that he was not part of our target audience, he, he was someone who was a referral, you know, um, just that work that we put into the world, even though it wasn't directed specifically towards him, still had value and meaning. And he still had an opinion of us instead of not really caring. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think, um, it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it's that. That's why I think niching can be. It, it can create fr unnecessary friction because what it does is it makes it backs people into a box where they say, mm. "Okay, I feel like I'm making a decision. Like I'm I'm getting married now. I'm getting married to this particular yeah. sliver of 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 focus." When you can think about it uh, in a more pragmatic sense than that, and mm. still get the same outcomes. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree totally. And may, I'm going to check myself on using the word niche uh, because you're right. It does have this uh, connotation of like a little hole that you burrow yourself into or something. It's like your little, your little yeah. spot. Um, now, okay. So when I think about uh, positioning and marketing and the how and what makes you different, like we have our own things that we've developed within a Nancy that we use to help people uh, simplify and clarify that. But I know that you have your own framework. Uh, would you be willing to share maybe some of the elements elements that go into positioning for you, uh, maybe some of the top ones. And if you have sure. a framework you use, yeah. Sure. I think without getting into the weeds, the, the most important part of this whole thing is that when you try to, to, to position yourself, what you're doing is creating a story, right? And so mm, if you take this, yeah. the status around being unignorable, right? What I'm doing mm -hmm. is articulating a future version of yourself where all of the things that are baked into that statement become true, right? People know who you are, they come inbound to you, you know, you don't have your, your, you experience less commoditization because they, you know, they, they, they see you as one different and apart. Mm -hmm. And for you and for anyone who's trying to do this, what you want to do is tell a story that is giving people a better version of themselves 
in the future. So it's about them transforming versus you being great. And that, Absolutely. that, that is the core of it, right? Are you a story brand fan at all? You know, I'm actually, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually not a big fan of that methodology from, for me, because I think it takes, to me, what he's almost doing is creating commoditized um, stories. Like he, he, mm -hmm. he bakes it down because, so I agree with he him. oversimplifies it? Yeah, it's yeah. over, it, and it's, it's allowing for no nuance, which is where the magic happens, right? And because mm. his, one of the examples he uses in that book is actually, it came to mind when I was using the cleaning example is, and excuse my French, but it's we paint all sorts of shit, right? That's mm -hmm. like that, that was his example of the, you know, how you would position a painting company, just we paint whatever. And it's, mm -hmm. that to me is, anathema to being seen as expert right then you're just somebody who's going to pick up all the painting jobs right it's what yeah. you want to do instead is say you know we transform uh, houses into show pieces you know what something that mm. is a specific promise for benefit that shows some better version for a specific kind of consumer who is willing to pay a higher premium for that service product whatever because you are speaking to that you know group specifically yeah yeah and uh you know i i actually really love once again better to be kind of for or against or have an opinion than just be kind of shrug story brands clearly doing something right because you immediately knew who i was talking about and had yeah. an opinion um but so You're then totally i'm curious right. Yeah. How, how do you then, uh, like I come from a narrative background. Like when I was growing up, I wanted to write fantasy novels. And I, yeah. if you had told me I would have become a copywriter, it would have blown my mind. <laughs> but actually copywriting is the closest form of writing I have found in like almost 20 years of writing different things that is like narrative. Um, but for those of us, uh, you know, those of who are listening who maybe don't have that narrative background, what are some of the ways, you know, we hear this all the time, like story, leverage the story, et cetera. You know, you've mentioned one element that's really recognizable, which is what do you hope to become or what do you hope to achieve? But are there any other ways that you can translate the story elements in kind of a practical way to this process? Yeah. So without going, I think for your folks, I think that the simplest way to really think about this is a person has a problem and they are up against resistance, right? And defining that resistance, the villain is really important. On the other side of that problem is a better version of their life. And the critical... Yeah the critical purpose or the critical point here being that this place over here is really hard to get to without some kind of help. And, the, yeah. and you are the one providing that help. And by the way, we've helped all these other people over here like you to get to this place. And if mm. you think about just those five discrete elements, then I think it becomes a lot simpler to think about and where a lot of stories fall down or a lot of narrative framework, like whatever you write, however you want to sort of contextualize this, a lot of mm -hmm. positioning falls down is that the outcome you're promising um, is either not that compelling or it seems like something a lot of people can help them do, right? Mm. So, <laughs> and so that's where you run into trouble in differentiating yourself because if it's either not that compelling or it's super easy to do, then now you're in the commodity bucket. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, would you agree with the statement? This is another thing I hear all the time that is like, huh, um, that the, oh, now let's hope I don't butcher it, but the, the force of momentum you can build is only ever equal to kind of the force that you're opposing. I.e., if you're helping someone do something really easy, there isn't a lot of value in it. I, I, and yeah. so it's important to kind of define what that resistance is and not be afraid for that resistance to be really big. Anyway, I, I'm going more into defining it than I wanted to. But I'm curious what you think about that statement. No, no, I, I agree with that. And I think if you look at most brands that get really mm -hmm. big, like let's take, let's say CrossFit from the fitness space, yeah. right? Yeah. What CrossFit did is come in and say, hey, you're doing steady state cardio and bodybuilding routines. And guess what? This is not effective at building functional fitness. Mm. This is the enemy, right? This is not going to get you in shape. It's not going to keep you healthy. And in fact, a lot of this stuff is making you worse, but you yeah. know, what's going to get, you know, what's going to help you high intensity, functional fitness, right? That's what, and so right or wrong, <laughs> this is the, this is the change CrossFit made, right? And then they made the CrossFit games that said, Hey, you want to look like these people, you want to be able to flip tires. You want to be able to do a bunch of cool pull-ups and whatever. 
this is your, this is how you, you get there. You we come to our CrossFit, yeah. pe- right? This is hard to get without our help, right? Mm-hmm. And so they challenge the status quo. And I think most people who do this effectively, and you can see Gary Vaynerchuk does this in the way he does things. Most people who, who challenge a position effectively or become known, they're, they're pushing against some kind of re- resistance and resistance, saying, yeah. Yeah. And saying that this is ineffective what you're doing today. Here's a new way. And by the way, we're going to help you get there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's really interesting. You know, I found that even for us at Anansi, you know, we've been doing great work for a long time, but at the beginning of last year, we went through a bit of a process of rebrand and we identified this thing that we stand against instead of being like, oh, you know, uh, we, uh, it was super long and complex, kind of like what our mission was. And instead we were like, we use the power of marketing to build strong communities because the alternative, (laughs) well, you can imagine a lot of people use marketing marketing for a lot of other things. And um, after, to be honest, if I'm being totally candid from listening to you, I think that there's some uh, work we have to do to make this uh, intersect more with our other kind of aspect of what we do is we help leaders stop putting out fires and actually like live up to their potential. Uh, I think there's some integration there to do. But I have to say, since we just started framing things with those two sentences, instead of trying to explain what we do, our traction with other people kind of, I don't know, the term you hear is like raving fans or whatever. Like it has just grown so, so, so much, even though the work we do has not changed very much. And that's really, that's wonderful to hear. And it's really, you know, a common outcome that I think a lot of companies are their sort of best kept secret. And I think um, it comes back to being willing to take that position. And if you look mm-hmm. at the modern landscape right now, like I think there's room for a marketing agency somewhere to say content marketing is bullshit. What you need to do is advertise, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and go completely against, and PS, there's a lot of uh, data showing the effectiveness of advertising, especially in B2B and that brand building yeah. actually drives more than direct response and, and, and so forth. So there's, I, I think challenging that whatever the status quo is in your particular space or industry, there's a big opportunity to have that conversation because there's going to be people who agree with you. And now you're the person yeah. who's talking about this thing and they're going to want to work with you versus the thousand other people, you know, um, evangelizing the same general ideas and, and the same sort of uh, vanilla uh, notions. Yeah. Yeah. And I I just kind of coming full circle with another thing that we were talking about earlier, which is uh, I think that it also helps you stand out because a lot of people are afraid to do this work, you know, to set themselves against something. Uh, And so not, uh, I I perceive that just the act of doing it, I I think this is reflecting on many things you've already said this session, but just the act of doing it is enough to set you apart. Uh, never mind how good that statement is or how connected you are to your audience, et cetera. You know, that's all, that's all tweaking. <laughs> yeah, no, and it, I, I think you cannot overestimate the impact of just patter, pattern interrupt generally. And, and an analogy mm-hmm. I use a lot when talking about this is that if, if you turn on a fan in your room in, you know, a few minutes, you don't even know it's on anymore, right? But if something explodes mm-hmm. outside your window, you, you're going to stop, you're going to look, right? And most brands, most companies are just the fan. It's the circular yeah. noise, similar things that no one pays attention to in our default mode. This is a biological mechanism is to tune this stuff out if we don't need to pay attention to it. It's why the fan goes in the background. So you need to figure out some method of being the explosion. Otherwise, yeah. you you are just going to become background noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed. Oh, my my brain is just has okay. lots of stuff going on. I just want to like excitedly message things to the team and have new ideas and work on things. Not every not every interview I do gets me this worked up. So uh, this has been just really <laughs> excellent. What a pleasure. Yeah. Um, all right, Brendan. Well. Uh, you've just given us so much info today, but I want to turn the focus a little bit more to just you personally. And I'm curious, what is it that gets you up in the morning? What is it that gets you out of bed other than coffee or perhaps kids <laughs> jumping on you? <laughs> yeah, what what gets me out? Are, you mean related to work or just, you know, 
generally? I get answers related to both. And I love both because sometimes, especially cough, 2020 cough, although by the time this airs, it will no longer be 2020. Um, yeah. But uh, also, you know, what what is that thing that motivates you? That's work, however you want to take it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a great question. What, I mean, at, at the lowest level or not the lowest level, I guess, you know, at the most basic human level, it's, you know, family, um, you know, yeah. getting up, you know, we have a 10 month old here. So, you know, he, he's going to be waking up and smiling and so forth. But on a, you know, on a work level, it's, I mean, it really is next. I mean, that, that's really what, what whatever, whatever's going to be next and trying to, you know, just like continuing to, to push and see what, see what comes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And in the midst of pushing and seeing what comes and living with a 10 month old, which is incredible and beautiful, but also, you know, let's be real, uh, has some, I'm sure, adjustments and challenges. Yeah. What is the number one thing that you do to preserve your wellness regularly? Yeah. Run, run, run a lot. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> is, that, that is it. And, and, um, you know, bulletproof coffee in the mornings, those two things, that's it. That's all you need, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, I mean, not the coffee. I'm super sensitive to caffeine. This is me on water. You don't want to see me on caffeine. <laughs> yeah. It's overwhelming. Um, <laughs> but uh, for me, it's cycling. I, I feel like I'm nice. flying. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of hills around here. So you get both the like, wee and the like, the push, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, love it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay. So are there any last words of wisdom that you want someone listening to this right now to walk away with? Yeah, I think overarching, you know, be willing to get out there, take a stand, put, put yourself mm -hmm. out there and do it without fear of judgment of fear of failure, fear, fear of alienating people and turn the position around it. If we're willing to say something unique, we are going to attract the kinds of people who agree with that to us. Yeah. And those are going to be the kind of people who care about what you have to say and who lean into yeah. your ideas and just be willing to put it out there and, and see what comes back to you over over the caveat being over a period of time. Don't do don't post mm. once or say it <laughs> once and then be upset when no one cares. Start today and look back in a year and see what's happened. Yeah, consistency and persistence. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I fully back that again as a company that's been around for uh, over five years now, but it was only really about a year ago, maybe maybe a year and a half now that we started to do the work that you're suggesting and night and day. It's like the difference between having a job and having like a company. <laughs> Almost. Almost. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's incredible. All right, Brendan, if people want to find out more about you, more about what you do, more about what you can potentially do for them, uh, where would they find that info online? Yeah, they can find me on LinkedIn at uh, Brendan Dell and uh, brendandell.com, which is B-R-E-N-D-A-N-D-E-L-L. -L. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Brendan. This has been such a pleasure and such an excitement to get to have hey. this conversation with you. Thank you. It's <laughs> been great. It's been great. Hey. Excellent. And as always, to anyone listening, I hope you have an excellent rest of your day. I hope that you can challenge yourself, maybe today, maybe this week, to just take a stand, even a little stand, on something that you were kind of hovering in the middle before see what happens. I'm interested to hear about it. Let me know. Message me. Tell me how it went. Message Brendan. I don't know. Now I'm just offering up your time. But <laughs> anyway, guys, hope you have a good one. Take care.